If you'll turn your Bibles with me to Luke, the 19th chapter, starting with verse 37. Luke 19, Luke 19, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Luke, the 19th chapter, starting with verse 37, right in the middle of a conversation. I'm real good at doing that. Today, we're talking about, is Christ weeping over you this Easter? Is Jesus Christ weeping over you this Easter? Or you also could call it a a time out for tears. And I believe the church, especially on Resurrection Day and even on Palm Sunday, that we need to be crying. We need to be crying about what our God has cried about. As he stood on Mount Olive, what did he cry about? What are those thoughts? What does he want us to be crying about in the world upon which we live in? Look at the 19th chapter, verse 37. It says, and when he was come nigh 
even now at the descent of the Mount Olives, or you can say Mount Vernon, either doesn't matter. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Verse 39, And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and he said to them, I tell you that, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he uh, was come near, he beheld the city and he wept over it. And saying that thou hast known, even thou at, uh, at least in this thy day, did you hear that? At least in thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace and now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come, in verse 43, unto thee, that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee around and keep thee uh, on every side. Now, I'm going to stop there and give you indentation. Ooh, I can't even say it. A insert. Jesus is seen 35 years in the future. At verse 43, of what's going to happen to Jerusalem. And shall they even with the ground and thy children with thee? And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou hast knewest not the time of thy, which means you, visitation. Verse 45, and he went into the temple, he began to cast them out that sold therein, and them that brought the bought, saying unto them, verse 46, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And when he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priest and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him and, uh, and could not find what they might do, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we look at this Palm Sunday, as we look about what it truly means, Lord, may it be a, a moment that we open our eyes, that we see a difference. Lord, you are weeping over us this Easter. Are you weeping over our America? Are you weeping over Mount Vernon? Are you weeping over us? And Lord, may we realize that we have enough to cry about. We have more to cry about. And Lord, I pray that we'll be a church that's brokenhearted about the things that you're brokenhearted about. And Lord, if there's one today that's lost, may these be the moments of salvation. Lord, I pray uh, that if there's one distraught, they may find the peace that passeth all understanding. But Lord, do we really want to know the true meaning of what Palm Sunday's about? What you're doing while you're weeping? What does it mean? And what does it mean to us? Or is today just another Sunday that just comes and goes? And so, Lord, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts, that we'll be those spiritual receiving stations, that we'll receive what you desire for us to receive. But we need to prepare our hearts. God, forgive us for we failed you, so we can hear and be in the holies of holies and lift our prayer to you. Lord, I pray that you'll bless us as we seek your will in all that we do in the days to come. Lord, I thank you for loving us and forgiving us. But I thank you today that you're alive and you live in us. So bless you and direct us now as we go further. Let us be careful to give you the glory, honor, and praise. And we pray this in your precious and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, God knows we have enough to weep over in America today. You know, the Christian life is a life of abounding joy. Somebody said a long time ago, joy is, the, uh, joy is the flag that's flown in the castle. In the castle of the person's heart is on fire for Jesus. When the king is in residence, and he is in residence, he is the king of kings and lord of lords. He died on that cross. He resurrected. We're going to talk about next week. But as we enter this holy day, as we enter into this holy week, as we make the beginning of that gesture by uh, Mount Olives, Jesus is weeping. We are to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. 
Sometimes we come to church and I think we don't have enough joy. Sometimes we come to services like we're mourning a corpse rather than hailing the victor. The one that has won the battle. For you and I, he's won the battle so that we don't have to fight that battle. He died for you and I. Sin may have its thrills, but my friend, sin does not have joy. And joy is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I wanted to say from the outset of this message that I believe in a life of joy. But the story is a little bit different. Because I want to say, however, the Christian life also is a life of tears. You say, what? It's to be a life of a broken hearted. We're supposed to be broken hearted about what we see and what we encounter every day of our lives. You see, Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes, there's a time to laugh and there's a time to weep. And I believe that we in America need to be weeping and keeping with the urgency and the emergency of the hour. If you hear what Jesus wrote, what he said on this very day, Jesus is facing his last week on the face of this earth before he's crucified. Jesus was a man of abounding joy, but yet Jesus was a man of abounding tears. You find Jesus in the Bible weeping. He wept at the grave of Lazarus. Those were tears of sympathy. You see him weeping at the Garden of Gethsemane, even to the place where his capillaries bust, and he weeps with blood. Those are tears of agony. But my friends, what we read today, he wept on Mount Olive. Those were the tears of urgency. I believe there's an urgency to the call of the tears like never before. There's an urgency to serve Jesus Christ in a world that has turned dark. It's time to let Jesus be alive in us. You see, is Jesus weeping over our town? Is he weeping over our homes? Is he weeping over our church? Or he's just weeping just to be weeping? Folks, he is weeping the tears of urgency. And I tell you, as followers, we need to be sharing tears of sympathy. There's not a doubt. We need to be sharing in the tears of agony. But my friends, I want to encourage you today that we need to be people with tears of urgency for the emergency of the day that we're living in because our Lord and Savior, He's coming again and we only have a short time to share the gospel message as quickly as possible, to win as many as possible. He doesn't want anyone to die and go to hell. He wants everybody to be saved and go to heaven. He's taking a path that we call on Palm Sunday today. We call it the Palm Sunday Road. Halfway down Mount Olive, it, he stopped and he wept. And when he wept, the word wept there in that passage is in Greek. And that Greek meaning of that word wept means he was having convulsions. That means that he was having sorrowing. That means he was having great salty tears rolling down the cheeks of the very Son of God as he came down into that city. He's weeping over Jerusalem. In the backdrop, he hears glory to God in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus is here. They begin to shout in the backdrop. Why in the world would Jesus, when he's going down into revival, when he's going down to where people are dancing and shouting and just all excited about the festival of the day, why did Jesus weep? What caused Jesus to weep? And what causes Jesus to weep ought to cause you and I to weep. And we go, I have no responsibility in this story. We do have a responsibility. There's an urgency to the day. And today is the day of that urgency. So let me give you three reasons why I believe that Jesus and the Word of God says that Jesus is weeping. And I pray that you will see it with me. Look at verse 37 and 38 to begin with. Verse 37 and 38 says this. It says, And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of Mount Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, and peace in heaven and glory on the highest. 
So I want to share with you as we celebrate the beginning of Holy Week, as we begin to think about Palm Sunday, as we begin to see the tears of sympathy and agony, but now we see the tears of urgency as Jesus wept because of their superficial religion. You see, had you been there, you would have said, hey, they're, they're having a revival time in Jerusalem. They're excited. These people are praising God. They are leaping and dancing and saying, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But today I share with you, the Bible says it was all superficial. It was all superficial. And today I ask you in the urgency of the day is what you do here on Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and even in your home when you worship, is it superficial? Is it real? It, do you, have you had that uh, with Jesus meeting before and it's real and you've been broken at the feet of Jesus? You see, they are very religious people and Jesus was riding on the donkey saying, and as he was riding, they said, hail him, hail him. And, and a few days later, that very crowd said, crucify him, crucify him, nail him to the cross. Halfway down the mount, it was breathtaking sight. As you can see in verse 45 and ver verse 46 of that passage, it says, and when he went into the temple, he began to cast them out that sold therein, and them that bought, saying unto him, it is written, my house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. When he got closer, the house of God had become a den of thieves. They were selling and buying in, in the house of God. No wonder that Jesus wept. It was Passover week, and it was a week that they uh, would... Uh, Kill the Passover lamb. And the sad thing, the tragic thing about it is, Jesus was the sacrificial lamb, and they didn't even notice him. They didn't even know Jesus was there. And, and they didn't know it. They didn't recognize him. Matter of fact, to them, it was just a religious ceremony. And they went through the ceremony, but they all, but they absolutely missed the meaning and hung Jesus on the cross. And how many of us this Easter are going to miss the true meaning of the cross? As the choir sang so beautifully, that cross is for our sins. That cross has meaning. But folks, church is not just coming and just celebrating. Church is a time to worship and praise a mighty God that died on the cross and shed his blood for you. Folks, let it not just be another thing. Listen, I'm tired of Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Church after church after church. Oh, we came to church, mark it off. Hey, we celebrated, it's done. Folks, we can't be superficial. It's got to be real inside of us. Jesus weeps over people who have superficial religion. And the question is, is Jesus weeping over you and I? I can't answer that. Only you can answer it. I'm not judging you. But there's an urgency to the call. You see, from the distance, it was breathtaking. But when he got up close, looks are deceiving, my friends. It was bad. Because when he got there, they were money changing. They were buying and selling sacrifices. Folks, that means that sacrifice was not coming from their heart. And if that sacrifice was coming from their heart, they would have had meaning. But this sacrifice is they're just buying. Listen, I know what happens. It happens to all of us. You know the church is having a cooking and they want you to bring dessert. Oh, I'll run to Walmart and pick up a dessert. I don't have time to make one. But listen... The sacrifice you make to make it taste, make, I want you to know from a fat man, it tastes a whole lot better. It tastes a whole lot better for a fat man. I can tell what's store-bought and what's not store-bought. What's genuine and what's not genuine. You see, and that's what he's talking about here is looks were deceiving. On the outside, they looked good, but on the inside, they were D-E-A-D, -E dead. Are we dead in our church? Are we dead in singing? Are we dead in, in our relationship with Jesus Christ? Jesus warned them about this in Matthew, the 7th chapter, verse 22. What did he say? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, cast out devils, and in thy name have done many works? And Jesus is going to look at them and say, I never knew you. I call it all iniquity. And we go, what, what, why, are, why are you attacking me? I'm not attacking you personally. I'm telling you that this is why Jesus was weeping. From the outside it looked wonderful, but on the inside they were dead. Do you know what Jesus would weep over in America today? Superficial religion. 
Do you know what Jesus uh, continues to weep over? Listen, people in America don't need religion. We need Jesus. We need a relationship with the one that died on that cross. And, and that paid that ultimate price for you and I. We need that vital relationship with the Son of God. Have you had the Jesus and me moment? You see, Mount Vernon and Berea is filled with religion. It's filled with religion. As Jesus wept over Jerusalem, may God help us to weep over our city. May we meet at the altar of every day of our lives weeping over those that are lost and that are dead and are dying and that are going to hell because they don't know Jesus Christ. May we pray that God will give us the wisdom to be a witness to those that are lost. You see, as Jesus wept over Jerusalem, many things that break the Son of God, they should break mine and your heart. It's time for tears. My prayer is that, that we would be, be heartbroken over the things that Jesus is heartbroken over. That's my prayer today. But he saw superficial religion just going through the motions. And I want you to realize that's why joy's not in churches anymore is because we're doing it because we've done our duty. We've done what we've been asked to do. We're not having that deep relationship. Listen, Christ desires. There's an urgency. They didn't even know he was there. They didn't even know. It says, is thy day? They didn't even realize it. It was their time of uh, uh, visitation. Listen, the worst thing in the world is to be a Christian and not know Jesus is alive and is is there within your midst. That's the worst thing in the world. So the first thing I would tell you is the reason Jesus wept on Mount Olive was because he wept because of superficial religion. People just going through this motion. And today I ask you, are you going through the motion? Or is this just another Sunday, just another thing we do? And we will be any different you see, if, we didn't, if we've not grown spiritually, I talked Wednesday night about uh, um, how to be a growing Christian. Listen, if you're the same as you were last year, you haven't grown in Jesus. We're supposed to grow and we're supposed to prosper. Folks, we don't need just to be drinking milk. We need beaten potatoes. We've got to be ready and willing to dive deeper in Christ than we did the year before. And have we done that? Will we do that? Or is that just something we talk about that makes us feel good? You see, from a far distance, it may look good, but on the inside, they were dead. Well, if you will, look at uh, verse 41 through 44 with me, if you will. And I want to give you a second thing. It says, and when he, uh, verse 41, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and he wept over it, saying, if thou hast known, even thou, at least, listen to this, at least in this thy day, it's their day, listen, and the things which belong unto thy peace. But now they are hid from thine eyes. Now, why is it hid from their eyes? Let me tell you, it's super, uh, superficial religion. Listen, when you're blinded by what's going on around you, instead of seeing what God wants you to see. Now, listen, verse 44. And shall, thee lay, uh, and shall lay thee even in the ground, and thy children with thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Listen, they didn't even realize Jesus was in the celebration. They thought it was just another celebration that they were feasting over, and that was it. Listen, here it is. Jesus wept because of superficial religion. Jesus wept because, listen, of their passing opportunity. Jesus wept over their passing opportunity that came their way. They didn't even realize it. It says they were blinded. They didn't even realize it. Listen, underscore, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. He is saying, if you only knew the opportunity that you have right now. The opportunity right now, he says. This is a great day of opportunity, but you're blinded to it. He says they were deaf to it. They didn't know, and they should have known. And today you should know that our world needs tears, that we need to be crying over what our Christ was crying over. It was this, their day, and they missed it. The Son of God was there, and they were blind to the blessing. They were deaf to the danger. Verse 42 says, this is thy day. 
And verse 44, because thou knowest not the time of visitation. You see, you see, God has harvest times, and harvest times pass. Now listen to me very closely, church, because we've had a harvest time, but those harvest times pass. The reason they pass, you want to know why they pass? Do you want to know why harvest times pass? It's because people neglect the harvest. You see, we've got to realize that harvest time, oh, anybody can get saved. Folks, harvest times do not last forever. Jeremiah, the, the weeping prophet, who, who wept like Jesus wept. Jeremiah warned the people about God's judgments coming, but in good times was rolling, so nobody was listening to Jeremiah. He, listen, he was a weeping prophet. He was a howling prophet. He was saying, hey, change your life. Hey, get right. Hey, judgment is coming. Hey, things are going to be different if you don't get where you're supposed to be. It's going to change. My friends, they laughed at him. They scorned him. The day came when the Babylon surrounded Jerusalem and cut the people off from their fields like ripe and food. Starvation set into the city so bad that the mothers were killing their children and eating them. My friends, there were so much kids. Listen, that's what Jesus says when he says there between verse 43 and 44, what he is saying is, hey, I'm looking 35 years ahead. I'm seeing the destruction that's coming. Folks, I want you to realize they had fields and the fruit was, was uh, rottening in the fields and the city was starving. Listen to what Jeremiah said in the 8th chapter, verse 20. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we have not set, been saved. He's saying it's too late now. There was a time. There was an opportunity. There was a harvest. There was a harvest, but they don't last forever. The Bible teaches when the harvest is neglected, it passes away and judgment comes. Think about it. Noah preached 120 years. The waters of God's wrath came. Nobody lived but his family. Listen, this generation, we have an opportunity, an opportunity more than we've ever had in, in human history. But we have a generation that's letting this harvest pass. And you say, well, what am I supposed to do? We're supposed to be teaching our young people. We're supposed to raise them up and share the gospel. I marvel at the patience that God has had with this God-blessed America. I'm amazed. You see, the harvest time, and that harvest time of youth passes. Young people are really in other places. If you'll look around in your service today, they're all other places, my friends. Ecclesiastes 12.1 says, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, to thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Folks, we need to get teenagers saved. Folks, whatever children you see in this service, they need to be saved. The boys and girls need to be saved. Parents, teenagers need to be saved. The Texas Baptist Convention said out of 100,000 polis, 8% said only the 8% said they were saved after the age of 20. More than half of the 100,000 people were saved before they turned the age of 15. The Holy Spirit conviction passes. You see, that's what Jesus is weeping about. They missed the opportunity. They didn't realize he was there. And my friends, Jesus is here today. He lives in you. He lives in America. And he will live constantly as long as we raise the banner of Christianity. But my friends, the harvest is passing. We need to get young people saved. We need to get people shouting and excited about what Jesus has done in their life. Listen, Genesis 6, 3 says, God says this, My spirit will not always strive with man. So we walk around with our chest poked out about what we did and what we didn't do and how good we are. Folks, what are you doing now with the passing opportunity? Are you going to let it pass and we do nothing or is it just going to be the regular thing and we don't see Jesus in it? Isaiah 53, 6 says, Seek uh, ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Parents, we need to wake up. Christians, we need to wake up. Church, <laughs> we need to wake up. Don't neglect. Stop procrastinating. Stop hesitation. That's the good word. Prost, uh, uh, procrastinating hesitation is a Southern Baptist word. Listen, the demons met. Do you know what the demons did? The devils came together in these demons and they tell each other, listen, let's just tell them the, the good lie. They got plenty of time. 
Folks, the road of hell is paved with good intentions. You see, the passing opportunity is here. Easter is here. Time is now. Listen, there was a prayer meeting in western Michigan where they, uh, where they were logging. A man was confronted with the gospel. He said, I'll attend to that matter when I'm through hauling logs in one month. That's what he said. Four weeks to the day, he was swimming in a lake with his profanity on his lips. And he drowned. The opportunity passed. He was one month too late. Now, my friends, there was a lady who couldn't sleep, so she wrote in her diary, Next week I'll attend uh, to the salvation of my soul. The lady died the next day. She was one week too late. <clears throat> one lady in New York City went to a revival meeting with her parents, and she was under conviction, and she said to them, I will seek God tomorrow night. Yet on the next night, she decided to go to a dance rather than to the revival crusade. Now, my friends, she was sitting in her dressing table, putting on her clothing and makeup. <clears throat> and my friends, she fell dead. She was one day too late. Another young lady in New York City was at a revival crusade, and she was with her aunt. Her Christian aunt begged her to get saved that night, to ask Jesus to come into her life, and she refused. And on the way to the re revival crusade, she was in a tragic accident, and she died. She was one hour too late. Now, my friends, opportunities pass. The fact of death is certain. There is not one under the sound of my voice today that's not going to die. The time of death is uncertain. And my friends, this was their opportunity. They had a golden opportunity. Jesus says, if you only knew the things that belong to you in this day. You see, do we realize what we have in Christ? Do we realize what Christ wants to do? He's knocking on our door and says, Hey, don't let this opportunity pass you by. Let's get fired up. Let's not be dead. Let's be alive. Let's not looks be deceiving. Let's look on the inside and make sure we're alive and not dead. Listen, he wept because of superficial, superficial religion. He wept because of passing opportunities. Listen, he saw 35 years that they were going to be surrounded and killed. Folks, it's too late to worship and give God your time when you are dead. You have to do it on this side of the grave, not the other side. Are we missing the passing opportunity? Is God knocking on our hearts, our hearts today to have tears for what's around us? Listen. Three quarters of a hundred thousand people got saved after the uh, before the age of fifteen, folks. That tells you something. As a Christian, you better reach your children. The passing opportunity. Well, there's one other thing that I wanted to share with you that I read in this passage that I hope that you'll put in your heart that will show you exactly what's going to take place in verse forty-three and forty-four. It says, For the days shall come unto thee, that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee around, and keep thee on, the, on every side. Again, he's looking ahead of time, 35 years. In verse 44, And he shall lay thee even to the ground, and thy children upon thee, and they shall not leave one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. So, Palm Sunday, what is Jesus doing coming down Mount Olive? He's weeping. Oh, superficial religion. People that are just going through the steps. Is he weeping over you? He's weeping about the passing opportunity. That they have the day and now's the time. And, and, and there's an urgency to the day and, and he's there. And they don't even recognize he's there. Folks, do we really know why we're going to celebrate Resurrection Sunday next Sunday? I guarantee you there's people sitting here that do not realize what next Sunday's about. It's about the death and burial and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Don't miss the main event. Don't let the opportunity pass you by. But then lastly, what do I find out that Jesus is, is weeping over? Jesus wept because of their smoldering judgment that was coming. As sure as I stand on this stage and you sit in your pew and you say, I wish that loudmouth guy would be quiet. 
there are going to be people die and go to hell. And I don't want you to go to hell not knowing that somebody told you. Because I am held responsible for each one that's sitting in this building. Whether if you like what I'm saying or not, I'm held responsible. And I want to tell you, there's a smoldering judgment coming. You see, Jesus wept because of their superficial religion. They're passing the opportunity. But now the smoldering judgment, Jesus with his tears coursing down his cheeks. He said, what did he say in verse uh, 45? He said, he went into the temple and began to cast them out that sold there within and them that bought. Now, my friends, Jesus looked way up into that future. He saw the Holocaust coming and he saw devastation. Titus and the Roman army came against Jerusalem. They crucified people till there was no more trees in the forest to crucify people on. That beautiful temple that was the greatest temple that was ever built to worship our Lord and Savior was brought to the ground. Jerusalem was plowed down and sold with salt. One million Jews died in that siege. They tell us that the blood ran down the streets of Jerusalem like it runs out of the gutter when you have a strong rain. And Jesus knew the future and he sat upon that little donkey there on Mount Olives and he looked down upon that city and his heart was broken. Jesus wept and said, Oh, my people of Jerusalem, if you only knew our nation is ripe for judgment. Ripe for judgment. And unless there is a Holy Ghost revival, we are in danger. I'm telling you, friend, the answer is in God's house with God's people. The answer is not our government. The answer is not money. The answer is not finding somebody else to blame. The answer is in the house of God. The church, we've got to rise up and we've got to tell them there is hope, there is strength, there is might, there is an urgency to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior because this earth will end. And my friends, I don't care if that incites fear inside of you and that you think I'm trying to incite fear inside of you. So be it. Because listen, this earth will end and people will go to hell. Just because it's you and not your grandchildren doesn't mean other people don't need Jesus. Proverbs 21, 19 verse 11 says, He that being often reproved and handeth his, uh, hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and without remedy. We need to learn how to pray. God has warned us. Suddenly they'll be destroyed. Folks, we need to cry tears. Cry tears as a church. God sees our tears. God is crying tears over our city, over our church, and over our lives. But my friends, salvation uh, is something that we need to be praying for for others. We need to realize the smothering judgment that's coming. I don't want any of my family and friends to die and go to hell. I don't want anybody in this church to die and go to hell. And Jesus is weeping because of that judgment's coming. Salvation Army was having a meeting one time. And they had run to a roadblock. They didn't accomplish what they wanted to do, but they wanted that they, they didn't accomplish anything at all, and, and they didn't know what to do. And it so happened that that uh, General William Booth, the founder of Salvation Army, wasn't able to be there because he was sick. So they sent him a telegram and says, "We're at a standstill. Nothing's happening. There is no movement of Jesus. They don't see the opportunity. They're blinded, and they don't see the resurrection Savior. What do we do, General uh, uh, Booth? What what are we supposed to do?" He sent back a two two word wire back. Listen, they said nothing works. Tell us what to do. He sent back two words: cry tears, cry tears. Jesus cried with tears over Jerusalem. And is Jesus crying with tears over you today? May God bless a dried-eyed church in a hell-bent world. We have no excuse. There's no excuse on Palm Sunday. When Jesus made that grand entry, it was not the grandest celebration. It was a moment of sadness. It was a grown moment of sadness and he saw superficial religion. 
He saw the passing opportunity and people just sit there when the altar call was coming and he just wept. And today, he wept because of a smoldering judgment. Not my judgment. It's God's judgment. And the wrath of God will be poured upon us. If there's anything I can tell you today, will you cry tears? Or is this just another Sunday and you don't see the need? You don't see the need to be emotional. You don't see the need and the urgency of people not listening to Christ. Listen, people are still crucifying Jesus today. Even in our congregation and in congregations to come. They're still crucifying Jesus. Oh, but we're out there saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. We put Bible verses on our, on our emails. We put Bible verses on our Facebooks. We put Bible verses on our walls. But just in a few minutes, we may say, crucify him, crucify him. What are we? Who are we? And do you realize Jesus is amongst you? It's your choice. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I love you and I thank you for today. And Lord, the challenge is there. You asked me to tell what it really meant on uh, why you're crying and why you're doing what you're doing. And so, Lord, we're going to talk about whosoever will. We're going to sing 314, whosoever will. And there's going to be people that will never move out of their pew that I've never seen move out of the pew since I've been here. And we need to be broken over the urgency because people are ignoring Jesus. And then everybody wants to know what's wrong. What's wrong is we need to see the urgency and the emergency of the day. Destruction is coming to this earth in the res when Jesus returns. And we need to be ready and say we've done everything possible. Well, Brother Jeff, you don't know the day and hour. I sure don't. If it was today, could you stand before the cross and say what you've done? Can you say that you've been superficial? Can you say that you've... Uh, um, that without a shadow of a doubt that you've missed the past opportunity? Can you say that the smothering judgment is not going to come to you? You see, today God's challenging us on Palm Sunday to see the urgency upon who he is and what he is. But most likely it will just be another day for most of you. We heard it. Sounds great. I'm just going to go home. Well, I can tell you it's not another day for me because my Jesus cried over me. And I'm thankful that he cried over me. I'll never forget the second church I pastored county over from where I live. A little girl from the first day I was there to the last day I left. That little girl came to the altar and prayed every Sunday. People says, why don't she just go sit in her seat? Why do we have to keep waiting on her? Why do we have to sing the invitation so long? My friends, that little girl prayed for 17 years. Four months. And she had so many days counted down that she prayed for her daddy to get saved. She called me when her daddy got saved. She said, preacher, preacher, I even had the honor to do her wedding ceremony. She said, preacher, my daddy got saved today. If we have any tears, I hope it's pretty tears praying for those that are lost around us. Lord, we love you. I love you. And I know many others here love you. I'm not saying they don't. But can we do better than what we're doing right now? You see, you're giving us a visitation right now. Do we see it? Or will we just crucify you again? Lord, your word says, whosoever will. And if you're lost today and you'll receive him, all you have to do is say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I fall short coming to my life. Make a radical change in me. Let me throw my old sins away and become new with a new nature. And a radical change take place in you and invite him in. He'll, we'll wait on you. There's one today that needs to come and pray for someone that's lost. Would you do that? You see, don't let us leave here dry-eyed. Let us leave here bent over what our Jesus is bent over. 
That's what Palm Sunday's about. Whosoever will. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this time. And we pray this in your precious and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen.